So you prepare yourself. But what happens when your psyche isn't quite there? What happens when you're slightly off balance? When you're struggling through some things and it seems like God allowed the devil to bring something else on you at the time when you're still trying to make heads and tails out of what you're fighting through. Has anybody ever been there before? Well, you've been trying to make heads or tails and it becomes a huge struggle to make sure that your perspective is right. Because if my perspective is not right, instead of fighting, I'm going to complain. If my perspective is not right, I'm going to start speaking things into the atmosphere that are also getting in my ears. Because did everybody know your ears hear what your mouth is saying? Amen. Amen. Your ears are hearing everything that your mouth is saying. You could think that it's nothing. But yet, these are either death-filled vehicles that you are planting to bring forth something that you don't want in your life. Or they can be life-filled vehicles that can encourage you in the midst of what you're going through and give you strength enough to stay on with it to see the manifestation. Your words are vehicles. Someone say vehicles. They get your thought out of your head. Your words get it out of your heart. That's why Jesus says out of the abundance of the heart. The mouth speaks out of the abundance of the heart. Whatever is in your heart, if you allow it to come out of that mouth, you're speaking spiritual things into the atmosphere. Saints, I want you to be very mindful of this. Be careful what you're allowing to come out of your mouth. Because if you start to speak negativity over yourself, you're going to struggle more than you have to in 2011. If you speak positively, even though we know the devil is going to come, Amen. you find that God works on those positive containers, Amen. those positive words that you're speaking. He works with that, and he encourages you in the midst of what it is that you're facing. Often, I would even tell you, it's good to read the word of God aloud. Amen. So often when we start reading, a lot of times we read quietly. And our ears really don't get it. I'm an educator. And that is one of the multiple intelligences, one of the modes that we use in education. Just in, on the side, I gave my students a test last week, and I gave them over a month to learn some things. A lot of them, I don't believe, actually put forth the effort to learn it. And maybe Pastor or Mr. Wood, I'm sorry. Maybe my expectations weren't that high because I already made the retest before I gave them the test. <laughs> I knew how that was going to turn out. Because I knew that a lot of them were not going to put forth the effort because I put it in their hands. I told you to go and learn it. I'm not going to say much else about it. In fact, I'm not going to say anything else about it. I'm going to see are you going to have the initiative to go and do it yourself. I have students who are members of this church. They'll tell you I don't believe in pop tests. You need to watch my board. My board, I have every announcement of everything that's coming up. And I tell you a lot of times, a month ahead of time. So if you don't pass it, really it's on you. But grace and mercy and understanding my students. 
Understanding I don't want to put all of those Fs in my book. <laughs> Understanding that I could very easily point the blame to them and say that you didn't succeed because you didn't do it. There do come cutoff points where you just have to do it or not. But I am glad that during those times when God is testing me, God is trying me. He knew I have not made it there yet. He allowed me to retest. Some of us had to retest in 2010. I'm not even talking about a state test. I'm not even talking about <laughs> you sitting up in a classroom. I'm talking about the university of life. Some of us had to retest some things. How do you know you had to retest, Pastor? Because you started going through it in 2008. And you hadn't mastered that concept yet. <laughs> oh, Lord, Jesus, Lord, help us. 2007, 2006, Lord, I'm not going to bring it into the next year. Here we are, the ninth day, 2011. You're still studying for that test. And you're five years into it now. Amen, somebody. Amen. Blessed are the Lord, highly favored. Lord, Jesus, you just grew me up. Lord, you grew me up. I know I'm spiritually mature. Baby, why are you still struggling with this thing? Ten years later. Amen, somebody. So God allows us to retest, and I'm so glad that God allows us to retest because when God allows us to retest, he allows us to get our bearings back right. Sometimes your perspective isn't right, and like I said, there do come times when there's a cutoff point when God says, now look, uh, you should be past this by now. And some of us beat ourselves up when we are not where we think that we should be. That's why we need to spend conscious effort, a conscious effort. God is not where I think I should be, but it's where you say that I should be. You know why I'm struggling with what I am struggling with right now at this phase in my life. You know why I failed that test for the 18th time now. This mountain looks familiar. I'm quite sure the children of Israel said. As they were 40 years in that wilderness going around in a circle. It was an 11 day trip. Deuteronomy 1-2 tells us that. Some people say it was a 3 day. Deuteronomy 1-2 basically tells us it was an 11 day trip. And it took them 40 years. God was working on their perspective. Looks like all I'm giving is the title today. God was working on their perspective. He says over in Deuteronomy 8, he says, I have you in this place to prove what's in your heart. You say that you trust me. You say that you belong to me. You say that I'm your God and you're my people. But yet I have you out here in a situation where I haven't even let your shoes wear out. I have you out here in a situation. How many people know what I'm talking about there? I haven't even let your clothes wear out. Some of us are complaining because we feel that God hadn't moved in the way that we want him to move. But God is trying to show you, baby, your lights are still on at home. You still have a house to go to. You still ride. But you're complaining about something that you've been praying about for a while. And because I have not taken you where you want to be right now or where you think that you're going to be right now because I have you in a place where you are struggling. I'm bringing something out of you right now that needs to be developed. And I know that it's going to take you being in an uncomfortable situation to develop you. It's not realistic for us as saints to believe that God develops us in the midst of calm. God chooses storms to develop you. God chooses your adversary, the devil, to help develop you. God uses those tests, those trials, to see if sooner or later you're going to start speaking the word of God over your life and start to develop in the midst of the storm. So basically what I did to the students was I told them, now the way that you're going to earn your way of getting the retest, I want you to write 
that stuff down 10 times. Because in repetition, you start to learn stuff that you did not learn when you glanced over it one time. Some people say, well, Mr. Wooder, how do you remember all those formulas, baby, repetition? It's not that I'm some kind of genius, but it's repetition. You keep seeing it over and over again. It just becomes second nature. Amen, somebody. And that's why God is trying to get us to the point in 2011, you should be tired of seeing some of the same stuff. That's why he says, count it all, Joe, when you fall into divers or different temptations, knowing this is the trying of your faith. <laughs> Jesus. So don't get down on yourself when God is allowing you to go through something different. It kind of catches you off guard and you're looking like, Lord, I, I don't know if I'm prepared for this. And God is telling you the whole time when you went through that stuff in 2005, I was preparing you. 2006, I was preparing you. 2007, when your best friend walked away from you, I was preparing you. 2008, when I allowed both of your parents to be taken away, I was preparing you. 2009, when your husband or wife may have been killed or Maybe you lost a child and you were wondering how could you ever gain the level of strength necessary to face something that you never thought that you'd have to face in your life. God says, I was using the negatives in your life to develop you. So I tell God, thank you for developing me, Lord. You can tell him again, Lord, thank you for developing. You know, there's some folks say, I'm, I'm not where I ought to be, but thank God I'm not where I used to be. I hear folks say that all the time, and I have to rebut. I have a little rebuttal on that one. How do you know that you're not where you ought to be? God has you exactly where you need to be, and God is waiting on you to pass this next test so he can take you higher than you have ever been before in your life. But God is not going to do it again in the absence of your trouble. God is going to do it in the very presence of your trouble. He wants to show you. Psalms 46, 1, that he's a very present help in trouble. He wants to show you that I'm going to let you walk through here by yourself. Your best friend does not understand. Your best friend has not called you in a week for a reason because I have not given them reason to call you. Yeah, yeah, I know you all used to talk, but you're going through something specific right now. You're going through something that I want you to get the point, and I don't want them to be a distraction to you. Somebody said distraction. Did you know that you can have certain people in your life that distract you from where God actually wants you to be? They can be good-hearted people, but God says, I want your focus to be on me right now. I don't want you all have good conversations, but you all spend too much time on the cell phone together. If you run down a detail of your minutes, you're talking to them about 3,000 minutes a month now, and you only prayed about 100 minutes for the month. So in other words, my question is, who are we actually consulting when we're going through what we're going through? God says, you're still in this because you're out of balance. Amen. Your perspective is wrong. You think that you can talk it out with a friend. And I like that song that says, I need to talk it over with Jesus. Because some things my friends are still struggling with and they don't really know how to help answer my call. They don't really know how to help even come at what it is that I'm facing right now. They don't really know how to take what I'm going through right now. They're still looking at me kind of crazy because they have no frame of reference. And you can even tell when people have no frame of reference of what you're going through. Because when you're explaining it to them, they're looking at you like you're a Texas mule in Arkansas. They're looking at you like you're Alice in Wonderland, like you just came from another planet. They're looking at you. They don't want to say anything, but sometimes they're kind of snickering. And sometimes they're just kind of looking at you and they're just saying, oh, I wonder, I always knew there was something different about them. And you take the word peculiarity to a whole new level because you just playing out strange to them. And, and they really don't know. That's why they started calling less because you're going through something. And God knew that you were going to be going through it. So, Lord, since you know that I have to go through it, just help me to keep the right perspective. I know the devil is going to fight me. Somebody say, Lord, help me keep the right perspective. 
Lord, help me look at this thing the right way. Tell somebody, hey, oh, God, you need to trust God so you can look at the thing the right way. Lord, help me to look at my situations the right way because...